impacted by email in a few uh, responses that we'll be uh, announcing towards the end of the thing. In terms of questions, you'll notice there is a little section there where you can ask questions. If it's general questions, I recommend you hold them to the end though. We've got 12 steps we're going to be run through in this presentation and if you put in a question too early, you might find the next slide is answering it anyway. So I'd suggest you hold on to those just towards the end and then we'll have an extensive question and answer time for you to ask freely any questions you might have. So. Let's jump into the presentation. So I'm going to be theming uh, tonight's chat around the book that I put out last year. I'll tell you a little bit about it. It's called Private Bodies and I actually uh, put this through uh, Kickstarter. You might have heard of that. It's a uh, crowdfunding site where you can put up an idea and get people to basically pre-order copies of whatever it is you want to make. Um, so you can you know, fund things before you get started. But that process, whilst it was challenging in itself, was just one tiny little aspect in the whole project. I was actually shooting for about two and a half years for that project all around the world and the amount of work that's involved putting together a book you really shouldn't underestimate. We're talking about, oh, how's that, okay, sorry, just getting, I've got some feedback in the room here. Um, you really don't want to underestimate the amount of work that's going to go into putting together a, a big book project. Shooting is one thing, editing is another thing, and then the actual book process itself is, it's a big job. Uh, but the rewards are really there. So, you know, we'll talk through the timeline with some specific examples as we go through. But what I'm going to be focusing on today is basically the process that I went through, the process and the learnings that I want to share with you to make yours a much smoother process and the importance of color management and calibration throughout the process because if you've ever printed anything, you'll realize if you're not using a calibrated screen for starters, what prints out doesn't match what's on screen. But that's really the tip of the iceberg. And then as I said at the end, we've got giveaways and a 20% discount on some great data color stuff to uh, announce it for you all. And you will also get that by, via an email for, so you can get it in the next couple of weeks. So, 12 step process. Um, I notice there's just a few questions coming in here, some people having um, an audio issue. Somebody mentioned that they weren't getting it so they left and came back and it seems like it's working now. So, although if you're having an audio issue, you're probably not hearing me right now, but I hope you all are. So step one, I can't recommend highly enough if you're going to put together your own book that you go out and take a look at what other books are on the market. So that's not to say to copy their ideas for content, but there's so many variables in a book that you may never have thought about when you first step in to make your own one. So going to a bookshop or going to an art uh, museum that has a good collection of art books you'll find that they vary wildly and it may actually uh, jump, one may jump out to you. You may find that having a really wide format is going to suit your kind of content or that having a square wheel or a traditional four by six kind of ratio will do it for you. But you want to have a think about that and also think about do you, how big do you actually want it. Some photos will look great if you're going to print them up to you know A3, A4, A5 or bigger sizes. Others may work just fine down small. But you want to think about that and think, keep in mind that the bigger you go, the more it costs and by far the more it's going to start to cost you to post all of that stuff out. Um, the other thing you want to think about is how long the publication will be. Some books are only 40 or 50 pages, but often an art book can go to two or 300 pages. The, the book I put out is over 200 pages long and it's, uh, you know, it weighs in at around two kilograms, so it's not uh, insignificant. How's our audio looking? How am I sounding, folks? Sound good? I always wanted to be a radio presenter. Um, the other big thing is paper stock. If you print your own photos, you would know there are so many different types of photographic paper out there, but there's just as many variables when it comes to books. Okay, so we're getting a whole lot of comments in that the audio is sounding good now. Thanks for the feedback, guys. I appreciate it. 
Um, I'm pretty good at making books. I'm not so great at audio. Um, so I literally went through and found books and kind of put together my, without making a scrapbook, I said, so I quite like this cover thickness. I like this kind of paper for the, the dust jacket. This is about the weight and type of stock that I want for my book. And I had all of that stuff lined up before I contacted anyone to start the process. And I would really recommend if you do find, you know, maybe a friend made a book or you find one in the shop that you really love, especially if it was self-published or an artist, a photographer that you can get access to, it may be worth asking them specifically where they had it printed because you may quite literally be able to go and use the same people, have the same paper and stock and everything used, so then you can achieve a similar kind of look and feel. Second one is determine your specifications. This is so important to keep costs down in the long run. It's, it's the truth that when you start looking at quotes for your book, I, I personally found a huge variation in the, the results that I was getting coming in. Even with the same specifications, I'd get at least a 300% variation between different countries um, and suppliers based on you know, what they were able to do for me. So something that you really want to nail down early before you even approach someone is exactly the dimensions you want, the paper stock and weight, the thickness or type of cover you want, whether you want a dust jacket or not, and the number of copies that you're after because they all have a really direct influence on the, the type of printing you should be looking at and your overall cost. And any kind of variation to your specs once you've accepted a quote it's probably going to incur an extra charge. Everyone's really competitive to get your business when you're starting out before you accept a quote, but once you're on board, of course, there's little uh, costs, and it may be that they've gone and ordered stock as well, so that's fair enough. In terms of number of copies, that's a vital one for you to think about, and you'll need to have a look at your own local suppliers, but generally, it's around about 500 to 1,000 copies, in my experience, is the, the threshold where it goes from being viable to get them printed at more uh, bespoke, small run places that are going to set up and do kind of a digital print to going to get it done on a press. So when you use a press process, they actually make, like you see in the old movies, they still make those big physical plates and they run your book through the, the big presses again and again and again. And it's the setup cost that really costs uh, a fortune. So it's only once you get, for me, it, the, th the breaking point was about 1,000, that over 1,000, then it became cheaper to go to a press option, and then the marginal cost of extra books was really insignificant, like going from 2,000 to 3,000 copies, you were looking at just a small percentage increase overall. And then you want to keep in mind what your final delivery date is, and that's, again, it's another fair cost, but if you want a top quality uh, product delivered in a short amount of time. That means the, the manufacturer is going to have to pull resources from other places to prioritize yours and you could expect that that's going to, to cost. Step three is get quotes. And as I said, you really do want to uh, shop around. Well, there you go. I thought it was about three to four times, but it was actually my up to five times the quote variations I got. And of course, um, if you're doing big runs, you may find, and I did find that uh, certain countries in Asia were the cheapest, but you really have to think about what's the, the cost-benefit ratio on that because for me, the cheapest quotes I got, I didn't go with them because there was no decent feedback and trying to work your way through some communication problems and questions over quality and what remedies you're going to have if the quality isn't up to standard. It, it, you will have to factor all of that sort of stuff into it. So for myself personally, for this book, I used a broker that's based in the United States who then went out and uh, spoke to the printer for you. So I spoke to this gentleman who would give me advice on you know, the different paper options I had and what specifications they required, and then he worked with the printer who I later found out was actually based in South Korea. Um, that worked reasonably well for me, but you want to look at all of your different options there. And 
if you are going to do a smaller print run, you probably find that you can get someone local who can do just as good of a job or a better quality job without all of those variables that, you know, it, it can be a stressful process not, not knowing how the thousand copies of the book you're printing are going to finally turn out. Um, whilst we're running through these, let me just send out a poll question to you all. I'm curious to find out who has actually ever made a photo book. So let's send that out. You should see those that popping up for everyone. Um, so take a look at that. Your options are, where are we? Yes, no, or I want to try. So it looks like a, half of you almost, based on real-time stats, um, or a bit under half have made one themselves and those who haven't most want to try to make one. Oh, look, I really recommend it if you're into your photography, uh, not all of us have wall space to print up 50 of our images, but you can easily fit 50 or 100 images into a book and it's a great keepsake. Beyond private bodies, I've made several, you know, uh, photo book of a small run of my own projects and then other photo books and albums for clients in a smaller run as well. Fourth step leads um, nicely on from the last one and that's to make sure your quote is comprehensive and includes everything because if you're printing, if you decide to use a printer that's offshore, the, there's a lot of different variables that may be involved like how is it going to be delivered to you, what's that going to do to your timeline, what are the risks in there. Um, also customs, taxes and insurance that can vary from place to place and it all does add genuine costs. The other thing you really want to think about and this can be a significant cost is whether or not you want to have a printed proof. So once you go through and you get your, your setup all right and you've sent off the book and there's no spelling mistakes or typos or any of that kind of thing, knowing whether the, the colors are all going to match up and if the quality of the paper finally is going to be as you envisaged, it's, it's a big thing for you to consider. If, um, if you're printing one, then you know, obviously you're not going to do a, a practice run for a single copy, but if you're printing 10,000, you don't want them all to arrive on your door and you find that the print quality isn't up to the standard that you are looking for. So there's normally a range of different options you can get done. You can get a full printed production copy of the publication sent to you as a one-off. Uh, that costs a fortune because basically they're making the full plates or whatever process they're using, they're doing a real one as a one-off and then posting it to you. You could genuinely be looking at thousands of dollars to do something like that. Um, the last option is that you can get what they call uh, digital or wet proofs where they use their highest quality digital printers that won't match exactly the press uh, copy but it will simulate it and be on the right stock for you that's usually a lot cheaper. Um, and then finally, the, the option that I went for was to get a selection of pages printed on the real machine, on the real paper, so I could see exactly how it was going to look. So I picked a couple of pages that had indicative images that I thought would give me a good cross section to be able to know, you know, what the images were going to look like in their final, you know, in all their glory and fortunately it was all pretty much okay. There was one or two images that I decided to re-edit before providing the final samples. Um, but you know, if you do a full printed proof then you want changes, that's going to incur extra significant cost because they need to remake the plates. Where are we? Okay. Step five, and this is a tricky one because on one hand you'll have a date in your mind that you want the books delivered to you, but you need to get a little bit realistic about how long everything's going to take when you're working out your, your final timeline. So going out and getting quotes will take time. You might find that the staff who do quotes are away or that some companies are quick and others are slow or that there's a bit of... Uh, you're not quite sure on exactly what's included or what's not, so there's going to be a bit of back and forward, especially if you're dealing with different suppliers. Then you really can't underestimate how long it's going to take you to edit your shots unless you have um, already edited up all of your shots and you're confident that it's all been done with the right equipment on calibrated screens, all of that kind of thing, and it's ready. That can, for me, editing, uh, doing my culling and editing of the shots, uh, I think I have a screen on this later, but it took countless hours to get all of that stuff to a stage that I was happy with. 
Then of course your layout. So for me, I had a designer actually do the designs for me, but that all takes time as well. And then I can't emphasize this enough, make sure at every point where there's review, whether it's with your designer or with your printer, make sure you have several rounds of amendments factored in or even an unlimited number. Because you might think three will be fine, I'll do one and then they give me the results and then I give more feedback and so on and so forth. But realistically, it's often people will go to 10, 12, 15, 20 different rounds to finally sort out and get everything just as they want because you notice little different things here and there. Um, of course then sending off the final files, getting the proofs, getting the actual thing printed and delivered which if it's being printed overseas and delivered by sea that process itself could take weeks or even months and then considering all of those steps you need to factor in big buffers at every single stage. And suddenly you're going to realize if I'm doing a big print run, this is not going to come together in a couple of weeks. We're talking a significant amount of time because you need to, for me, I put in a one and a half to two week buffer at every single stage. So in case my designer got sick, I'll put in a couple of extra weeks. In case there's crazy storms, I'll put in a couple of weeks for delivery everywhere along that to make sure that I didn't actually run over time. And then the next one is how many images do you think you should actually include? So now that you've got your, your specs all organized and say you've decided I'm going to make a 200 page book. So how is it going to look? Are they all going to be full page images or are you putting several different images on a single page? And then that will give you at least an idea of how many images that you have to include. For example, if you, for me, I think it was around 300 to 350 images I, I felt I could fit in private bodies. So there's no need to go through and do specific editing and retouching on 500 shots if only 350 are going to be finally in it. That's days of extra time that could be better used. So going through and culling down your images is really a, a key step. For me, I like to say from a for mine, I was shooting everyday people nude in their own home and it was about 90 or so different subjects. So I treated each of the subjects as an individual kind of a chapter and I would go through and say, okay, so this person has two pages and go through and I would cull down to say my top 10 pictures from the shoot and then leave it and come back and then try and cull that down to five and then three or whatever the final number was so I could get a selection that I thought worked well together. If you try and do it all in one go, I personally often just feel overwhelmed and find it difficult as well to know which ones to include when there's a couple that are quite similar to each other. So you might find that this one has this kind of a, an atmosphere to it and this one is similar but it's a little bit darker or moody or edgier, that kind of thing. And then you run the risk of including both of them Generally, I think it's better to just have images that really stand out from each other rather than having duplicates. That's true whether you're making a, you know, an art book or a, an album for an event or a wedding or that kind of thing. When you're going through that editing process, I can't recommend this enough. I've only myself started using the Spider Checker recently, but this thing, uh, the Data Color makes both of them. There, there's actually two devices shown there in the image at the top the cube thing which is on a kind of a diagonal angle to us is what they call the cube funnily enough and that one's great for when you're going through and editing your shots in Lightroom or Photoshop or Aperture whatever you use it's got white and gray surfaces so you can pick your highlight your your white point for your white balance plus it's got uh, I think you can see my mouse here just where my mouse is there's a cutout in the plastic which will let you pick a perfect black point and there's a reflective area which will let you pick your, your brightest or most blown out area. So that quickly can help you set your tone parameters for the image. And then the spider checker is one that I've only just started using myself. But if you are in a situation where you have tricky lighting conditions or if you just have, you know, you want to calibrate the output of different cameras, 
it's so handy. Not every camera deals with color, well every camera I should say, deals with color in a different way. So I own several different cameras, some from the same manufacturer and some from different manufacturers and if I shot with all of them in the same shoot, some lenses are cooler, some are warmer, some, you know, uh, I, I find that my Nikon cameras, the sensors tend to emphasize the blues and greens whereas the Canons often give richer uh, reds and oranges. But if you don't want those differences and you want to be able to cancel them out and have everything looking the same, the spider checker is really great. It will match up in the editing process. It gives you kind of an overlay grid where you can, it will measure each of those different colors and it knows how the, the object was printed and what exactly that color of white should be and what exactly that color of pink should be. And it will match that up so that what's in your file is actually what was shot in front of the camera. Then, of course, the next stage is you need your monitor to be properly calibrated. I wonder how many people, uh, I bang on about this a lot on my channel, there's no point being serious about your photography and editing your images if you're not doing it on a calibrated screen. You can have the world's most expensive brand monitor, but if it's not calibrated, what you think is perfect blue or perfect pink or perfect whatever, it won't be. Nothing ships absolutely right. So who is calibrating their screens? Let me just send out another poll here. Um, I use the Spider 4 Elite, so I'm interested to see what you guys are using. Okay, okay, so quite a few using um, Spy. The majority are using Spider 4. Um, good to see. Uh, you know, I, I haven't seen an empirical test on this, but I really think that you'd be better off having a really entry level monitor, like a one or two hundred dollar monitor, and have it calibrated so to the best of its ability it's showing the right colors, then you would be having a several thousand dollar monitor that you don't bother to calibrate. There's no point at being able to show you a billion different colors if they all have a color cast to them. That's just ridiculous. Let's jump back in. So this is one that um, fortunately, I guess fortunately, I have a lot of um, lawyers in my life. So the I got some, what are we looking at? Stop the poll. Close the poll. There we go. Okay. Uh, so just a bit of feedback for everyone. We've got 48% of people using the Spider 4, 30% on the Spider 3, 8 on the Spider 2, and 14% other brands. And there may be some who didn't answer who um, aren't doing it yet. So consider it. Um, I took the step on my book to check if I was legally ready uh, to publish. Uh, check with your local laws, of course, it depends how the images were shot and what the nature of them is and if you were hiring models or if they were taken on the street or on holidays, that kind of thing. A lot of things and if you're doing it for your own, you know, a book for yourself to keep, that's a different thing to making a commercial publication. But if you are using image waivers, make sure they're in order. I would recommend before you go out and shoot a really big project that you make you have someone check your waiver to see that it is legally sound. In fact, the, at the end of this, I'm giving a, a discount code for my Intimate Portraiture video series. Part of that is an image waiver and a run sheet, which could be of use to you. Um, but you can go to a lawyer and show them the images, show them the layout of the book, um, and show them all the waivers you have and get them to write a legal declaration that they believe the publication is safe to publish, for lack of a better word. I'm not sure what the legal term is, but basically that you've covered your backside, you've got the waivers you should have, give you any sort of feedback. If you're doing a small couple of books for yourself or an album for a client, of course that's not necessary. But if you are going to do a commercial publication, it may be worth the cost. I'm not saying that it is for everyone, but you know, if you're doing something like with nudes, then that may, it's kind of the area that you want to make sure you've done everything by the book. It's not the fun side of photography that we always think of though. Um, in terms of actually editing the images, as I said, be super tough on your culling and as I have said in the last bit before the poll, have to use a, a, a calibrated screen. When I was editing this, I was really fortunate to get a top-of-the-line monitor for several weeks 
to use and I was still recalibrating it every two days just to make sure that the images were going to be correct. If you're using a great printer, then they should be calibrated. So what the output of their printers should be matching, you know, the, what's inside your files. Of course, the paper stock and all of that kind of thing comes into play as well. But if you want what is on your screen to accurately be reflected in what's in the file, so when the file goes to the printer, then they accurately print that for you. You need your display device to be showing you the right colors. And for me, it was a solid three weeks of editing for private bodies, and that's you know six or seven days a week and ten or twelve hours a day. Um, it, it's just soul destroying, to be honest, to be stuck behind a computer monitor editing like that for so long. So you want to fact make sure you factor that into your timeline as well. And of course, there'll be some images that or some projects that don't require a lot of editing, which could be a lot quicker for you. Um, another one that I'm using, and I use it now on every camera and every lens, and this is something that you'll often find when you get your shot, say you've taken a beautiful portrait of someone, you're on holidays, your loved one or just someone on the street, and you shoot with your fancy new lens wide open to get the nice soft background, and then you find it wasn't quite sharp, it was slightly out of focus. In my opinion, you can't accurately sharpen an image that's out of focus. There's all kinds of great software out there now, and Photoshop does amazing things, but if you don't, you know, say you're doing a portrait, if you don't get the focus right on the eyes, you just, you can't get that back. You can bring up contrast and clarity and all of those sort of things, but you're never going to see that fantastic detail in the skin if it's just out of focus. That information is lost. So the lens calibrator, or the lens cal as they call it, is so useful. I've used it on every single one of my lenses and camera bodies, and you need to use them with the body that, and lens as a combination that you're going to be shooting with. It's not to do if you're using cheap cameras or top-of-the-line professional ones. As long as your camera has the capability to do uh, autofocus adjustment, it's worth doing because all camera manufacturers and lens manufacturers have a certain tolerance of accuracy that they'll let out the door. And if you find that your camera tends to back focus a little bit and the lens that you happen to be shooting on happens to back focus a little bit, once that's in combination, you could find that when you're shooting at 1.4 or 2.8 and focusing on the eye, you consistently hit the tip of their nose or their temple and it can ruin the shot for you. So it takes all of maybe 10 minutes to go through and calibrate a camera and lens and then you know, maybe a couple of hours if you've got a lot of equipment to go through and do all of them, but at least then you know when you, if your camera is accurate in its autofocus, that you can be confident in the shot that you're getting. And for Facebook and, you know, sharing images online, you probably never need to look at your files at 100%, but when you're printing, seeing how the file is at 100% is a really good indication of how it's going to print if you're printing the images big. And that's when you're going to notice that if images aren't sharp, which is one of the reasons, other than being just tech geeks, that we check those things when we're doing lens reviews. So the next step is design and layout. And I feel like on every one of these steps I've been saying don't underestimate the time involved, but this is another one that um, really can take a huge amount of time. For private bodies, I um, this is the most thankful thing in the process for me. I decided to use an external designer to do it for me rather than designing it myself. You know, as photographers, we may have an eye for composition and for how we want things to look, but it really is a different skill set. If you happen to be a photographer and you're great at design and layout, then that's awesome. You can save yourself some money. But if you're not, consider hiring someone to do it. On one hand, they'll probably do a much better job than someone like me would do or uh, an everyday person, but they'll also do it in a fraction of the time. It's specific software and they have an idea for what's going to work in terms of layout. They know all about font and the use of uh, color and space for a publication. Sometimes being, you know, homemade and, you know, personal and have a personal touch can be a good thing, but for a book, I you know, for my book anyway, I didn't want that look. I wanted it to look really professional and smick, and 
it would have driven me crazy. Having done them before, you know, especially if you're doing one where you're sending it off to a commercial press, having um, having to provide a final PDF where everything's open to you, it can just drive you crazy because should I move that a little bit left or right? Is it going to look better centered and how do I offset things? If you're doing a smaller run and using a print service, then often they'll have really great and intuitive software that's uh, kind of drag and drop in interface, which can be a great option for you. But if that's not your strong point, consider hiring someone to do that for you. The amount of hours of time it can save you and the headaches and lost hair and lost sleep, uh, I think it's really worthwhile. And in that process as well, I probably had over 20 rounds of changes, so allow lots of rounds of changes in your quote with your designer. And of course, being that this is, well, I almost said 2013, 2014 now, you really want to consider having an ebook as well as your hardcover one. I have to admit, I had to be convinced of this myself. I was planning to just do a hardcover book because, you know, I think my images will look great being uh, big and in print and it's, uh, it's got a little bit more status to it and it's nice to have something real and tangible on the bookshelf rather than just on pixels on the screen. Um, but I'm so glad that I did. Uh, for one thing, posting a hardcover book from where I live in the world, Sydney, Australia, over to Europe can cost 70 or 80 dollars for a single book and it can take two weeks whereas I can you know email a PDF or an ebook for Kindle or Apple devices and it's there instantly and there's not much in the way of delivery charges that kind of thing and people are then able to instantly review your work so I'd recommend that you at least consider it it's not that difficult if your designer has experience with ebooks if they're making a print ready PDF, it's, from what I understand, it's as simple as down resing the PDF and then just getting it to integrate into the different software formats so it'll work on a Kindle or an Apple device and get that quoted from the start. Because again, if you ask for a quote to design a book and then throw on at the last minute, oh, can you make these three electronic formats as well, you can expect that you're going to pay for that as well and it could throw off your budget and your timeline. So get that spec in from the start. It's really a, a marginal cost, but you could find that your content works better in an electronic format and that that actually is going to be the best seller for you over the hardcover ones. And it's a lot easier to warehouse 20 megabytes in files instead of you know an extra 500 books. I'm curious at this point, um, I really like to encourage people to undertake personal projects that will develop their photography or pursue a passion of theirs. So who's working on a, an ongoing project or has a project in mind that they want to uh, get involved in that they think would suit making a photo book at the end of it? For me, it's, it's just great to have a, a tangible thing at the end of your project that you can hang on to and then in 2025 look back and say, well, in 2014, I worked on this great project and here it is. Here's the evidence of it. Um, so it's a nice uh, result there. Lots of people working on projects. If you're not, I would recommend it. If you're finding time to get out and shoot here and there, you might as well make it targeted. It's a good way to develop your skills, if nothing else. It looks like we're at just over 80% of yeses. Any other feedback? Excellent. Okay. So, step 11, getting down to the pointy end. So we've been through and we've worked out all of our costings and our quotes and our timeline and edited our shots and culled them down and got our designer on board and we've gone through the seemingly never-ending process of giving feedback to get the PDF looking just how you want. Now it's time to send it to your print broker. You want to make sure you've followed all of the specs and uh, design guidelines that they gave you. When you start dealing with a broker or a printer, they'll tell you what your bleed area should be, what, how the spacing should be, what the file formats and all of the different variables should be. If you've gotten a designer or you're a good designer yourself, that you can read through that stuff and it's no problem. If you're uh, not a designer, then it can look like a whole different language, so make sure you've forwarded that on to your designer so that all of that stuff is met. Otherwise, you could be looking at a time, you know, a time delay for them to fix all of that stuff. And then the second one is reconfirm your timeline with your printer. 
uh, when you get really deep into a project, it's easy to you know get frustrated when other people aren't keeping to their deadline. But of course, if you've been working on the editing and all of those processes for four or six months, it's quite possible that the printer their their workload has changed and they may need to tweak things a little bit. So make sure you reconfirm it. For me, I was actually all the way through every couple of weeks. I was emailing my broker and the printer to check, is everything still on track? If I get the files to you by this date, can you still deliver by that date? Um, it's, it's good for everyone to keep tabs on that kind of stuff. And the final step, after all of that work, and trust me, it is work, but I'm going to do it again. I absolutely love the process. You want to make sure that you are giving feedback to them as quickly as you can. Once you send the files off, it doesn't finish. Of course, if you're getting proofs and that kind of thing in, or they have questions about how it's meant to look, you want to give them feedback quickly. If they've got the presses primed and they're waiting to print, and they send you an email and you take three or four days, that's, of course, that's a delay that you're going to have to bear in your overall timeline. And then you want to keep your audience updated, whether it's the, the clients or it's, the, for me, the people who ordered my book on Kickstarter and were waiting for it, um, or if you have some kind of a following for your business or a mailing list, you want to give people a little bit of an update of when things are going to be coming because, you know, everyone has a busy life and it gets complicated to keep track of things. So whilst it can become your world for three or four months how this book is going, other people may just forget that it's even in process. So keeping people up to date so that they know that everything's on track and how it's coming along is a really important step, especially if this is a stepping stone for you to develop your business. And I have to say, having had the good fortune to meet some amazing photographers from around the world, so many have made their name through a personal project that was just a passion and it wasn't for making money, but it ended in an exhibition or it ended in a book that that's what made their name for them. The daily in and out of whatever style of photography you're in to pay the bills or you know to excite your passion, it can be the one that where you're really driven and really tied to the subjects that you create your most astounding work that's really going to get your name out there. So keep that in mind. On that, let's just ask, what do you think is the most important element in a photo book? If I hope some of you already own photo books out there, but do you think it is the photographer who put the book together, the actual content of the photo book, the, the colors, how accurately and beautifully it was printed, or do you think it's something else? What is it that would make you keep going back to a book or buy it in the first place? Let's send that poll out to see what you think. Wake up, everyone. <laughs> okay, good one. All streaming in. Of course, I personally think it's all about the photographer. But no, of course, content is always king. You have to have compelling and engaging uh, material. Um, I, you know, if I was answering that, it would definitely be content. But I would say that the the next one would be the, you know, how it's been laid out, you know, so the the content and the way it's been formatted, and then of course, if you're dealing with landscapes or people, or I would argue anything, but those are the two that you know first spring to my mind. Having the colors looking right, or not necessarily right, as in true to to nature, but true to your vision as the author of the book is really, really important. Good one. So this is the overall kit that I use from Data Color. It's uh, all the different things that I showed so far. I'm actually looking at two of the three pieces right now. The screen calibrator there, front and center, I use that every couple of weeks and I have it set up to send me a reminder to tell me that it's time to recalibrate my screen. If you've ever watched me um, presenting where I'm capturing my screen on one of my reviews or something, you've probably seen the reminder jump up telling me that it's time to do that again. Really handy and screens just change. It's a piece of technology. It, they Sometimes they fade, sometimes the light balance is different. You do want to make sure that you're still calibrated. So I have two different monitors and they you need to recalibrate them every now and then. That's just the nature of every type of screen. Then the cube, the color checker, and then the lens cal as well. And that one actually all comes in a, an integrated kit, which can come in a little carry bag as well if you if 
you know, if you're after all four of those specific pieces. So we're getting towards the end now. I'm going to, we'll just go through and uh, pop some info up on the different deals and giveaways we're going to have here and then get into the questions. So if you have some questions you want to start firing away, anything to do with how to make a photo book or any of the things we've talked about today or the different products that I use from Data Color, then fire them through now so we can start sifting through them. Um, there's all of my details there. Um, if, you, if this is your first time coming across, everything's labeled as Matt Granger now. So the website on YouTube, Facebook as well, and then Twitter and also Instagram, the handle is underscore Matt Granger because Matt Granger was already taken. And then if you're looking for advice or feedback on products or help to choose, then datacolor.com is the place to go forward slash support if you're looking for a specific question and answer on different products. Now, we do have some giveaways, as I said, I'm going to be giving away some copies of my Intimate Portraiture video series. Uh, that's for anyone who's interested in learning how to take that style of new portraiture. It's four or five hours of full HD video content taking you on lots of different photo shoots and showing you the gear we use and how we pose and light and work with the subjects to get beautiful images. Um, and that's an instant download and we'll be giving away some copies of private bodies as well. So you don't need to do anything to enter that just by being here. Uh, the, the system somehow will choose people and let us both know that you've won. And the guys at Momento have come on board as well and they're offering a $150 gift voucher to someone who's in the room to make a, a gift book. Uh, the guys who, uh, right now I'm sitting next to a guy from KL Australia who has helped make all of this happen. They are the data color distributors in Australia and they work closely with Momento over time and they're, they're a great company. So thank you very much for your support. Of course, thank you to data color for putting this on and KL for making it happen. My connection was fairly good enough so they're here um, giving me all of the technical help that we need. Now, this counts for everyone. Um, for those of you who don't get an email tomorrow saying that you won, if you're interested in purchasing either of those, the, the ebook download or the Intimate Portraiture video series, I've got a 20% discount up, which is thanks to Data Color, um, which is available for the next two weeks or so until the 12th of March. And the code for that one on checkout, you just add it to cart and then add spider MG and that'll take 20% off for you. All of this info will be sent out in an email if you miss this anyway, but the code for all of the discounts I'm mentioning today is SPIDERMG, or one word. And then KL Australia, as I said, who have been here helping us out with all of this and basically setting the whole thing up, they're also offering a 20% discount um, off the SPIDER4 Pro screen calibrator, the lens cal system, which like I said, that's, I mean, I. I use the, the Spider 4 Pro, oh, sorry, mine is the Elite, but I use the screen calibrator regularly every couple of weeks. But probably in this year, the thing I've been using most of all is the lens cal. I've been going through and calibrating every one of my cameras and lenses with that. And then also the, the checker. So if you're looking to get perfectly accurate color or to color match your different uh, equipment, then that's the guy that you want to use. So let's take a look through the questions now and see... Uh, what we've got here. So let me just check with my technical guru. So the ones that have an answer already flagged, they've you've answered them in text, is that right? Okay, so let's just take a little look through. A lot of these are comments. Let's have a little look. Okay, here's one from Denise. Hello Denise, I know you. Um, with shipping costs so high, do you include insurance as a part of that cost? I've had two international book deliveries which never made it to our box. Well, that's annoying. Um, it's a tricky one because for me, uh, generally I would say yes, if I'm shipping internationally, uh, Australia, Australian Post does include some insurance with airmail stuff and if you're using a courier then there's the option. But not every country and not every shipping method gives you the choice to insure your items. So for me, for most of my international postage, and this is something that I think will apply to nobody in the audience, but for me, I actually had, uh, I don't remember the percentage, but a good number of the books that I needed to post internationally sent from South Korea straight to Hong Kong, and I sent them from Hong Kong to the rest of the world instead of from Sydney, because even though Hong Kong still 
kind of in the middle of nowhere. The postage price was about a quarter of what it would cost me from Australia. But certainly, I think you, as a general response to that question, and I know you're actually in the States, Denise, where postage is a lot more reasonable. Uh, well, it's a lot less in the middle of nowhere as well, to be fair to Australia Post. Um, yes, I would include all of those costs in there or absorb it into your pricing somehow. So for me, I know that you know it costs me X to post within Australia and it costs me X to post to America or South America or Europe and I factor that in. So when you know my hardcover book sells for $80 plus postage, the plus postage that I'm charging people isn't my actual cost. I actually pay more than that but I factor that in and it works out to be uh, consistent across all the people uh, around the world who are ordering. But there's always funny little countries that for some reason are twice the price to the country next door or have a really bad history for not delivering stuff. Um, here's one from Rosalie. What percentage of your print run sells? I don't have a straight up number on uh, a number front of mind on how many are sold now, but the way I had it set up with Kickstarter, we we sold enough to make the project worthwhile straight off and then we had the extra copies to sell into the future. And they sell quite, you know, every couple of days we're selling, we're going to the post office and posting off copies, but I'd say out of my print run, I'd still have at least 500 copies left. Um, but the ebooks I've found are really successful. Um, I was totally off track when I thought that they were a waste of time and I would say that we sell more ebooks than we do hardcover books now which is great and they have a no marginal cost or very little anyway. Uh, one here from Andre, when you use a commercial photo book manufacturer because of the paper stock used you never get the same as the calibrated image, it's a bit flat, did you have to boost beyond normal? I spoke to a local photo book printer, they confirmed this issue. Um, that's a tricky one because there are there definitely are stocks that happens uh, to what you're describing there. And let me tell you, uh, color calibration as I've been talking about it tonight, it's pretty simple. Spend a few hours, get your head around it, you'll work out how to calibrate your monitor, you'll work out how to calibrate the focus of your lens and how to use the color checker to get that right. But then when you get into the printing side of things, it's a whole other can of worms which is really quite complex and you'll find that this, for example, Epson printer running these specific inks using this specific paper needs this specific uh, profile. But if you change the paper or you change the ink or you change the model of printer, even if it's still an Epson, for example, it needs a different profile for how it deals with colour. So there will be some papers out there that actually uh, are more vibrant and quite shiny and that you know show up different tones differently. So it will come down to if you're using a, who your printer is and what kind of options they give you and if you're able to get uh, printed proof. There's a couple of really famous uh, standard shots um, out there that are like test calibration shots. You can ask for a sample to be printed on the printer with the paper they're going to use and send it to you so then you can do a visual inspection if you don't have the equipment to do it, a visual inspection to compare it to your screen to see how it's coming out compared to your actual file. So that's an option but the, um, the mass produce online type uh, publications may not offer that kind of thing as, as is always the way if you're going for cheapest price you're not going to get best service. Um, another one here um, from Denise about how to, can I explain how to use the checker. So it's, um, it's a really visual process I have to say, not having the slides here it'll be a little bit difficult but I am actually planning a video to demonstrate how to use this one in the next couple of weeks. But essentially uh, you're going to have to use your imagination here, as I said I don't have the imagery with me, but let me just flick through my slides so you can at least everyone can see what we're talking about. Um, so let's take a typical example, two different examples. One would be you're shooting a model in a studio using certain lights. You would get your subject to hold the card as straight up and down to the camera. You take a shot under those lights and then when you get that sample file, you 
install a plugin for Lightroom or whatever software you're using, which it, you know, once you've got the, the, the color checker that, that's free, you just install that. And then basically you crop in onto that part of the image, put an overlay over it, which it, again, this might sound technical, but it's a whole five second process. That will then remap all of the different colors, maybe a slight tweak, maybe a big one, depends on the individual shoot. And then you can copy and paste those color profiles across everything you took under the same lighting situations and then it's all bang on. Same um, if you shot over a full day wedding, you're shooting Canon, your partner's shooting Nikon, you shoot 2,000 images between the two of you, you can calibrate the different uh, resulting images so then everything's going to match so there isn't a big difference between the two. Uh, I hope that made sense to you but it is kind of quite a visual process so it's something that's worth seeing step by step so stay tuned for a video on that one. Um, uh, Paul asking what software I use to develop the book. Uh, in terms of editing I use Adobe Light or Adobe or Adobe, I never know, it's like Nike or Nike. Um, Lightroom and Photoshop is what I uh, did all of my image editing on but as I said I got a professional designer to do the layout so I'm assuming he was using one of the Adobe suite but I really don't know um, and I don't mind either as long as he delivered and gave me a good high res PDF at the end of it that's all I was after. Um, so for commercial presses that's generally what they want is a print ready PDF that excuse me that's got the bleeds and everything in place um, whereas the online ones and I'm 95 percent sure Momento would be the same they provide a kind of software where you can use that to drag and drop your images and to get different layouts or they probably support you providing a PDF as well um, I believe that's the case um, Okay, from Aaron. One thing I highly recommend, talk to your printer from the start about things like page size, number of pages, custom sizes. It may be terrible for print size sheets. Yeah, that, that's a good one. Um, I, I didn't go into too much detail on that, but that's part of the quoting process. Um, it can seem like prices are just being pulled from the air when you get quotes for this kind of thing, but that's a really good point. Imagine if you were making a suit from a piece of fabric and then one manufacturer is using meter wide rolls and the other one's using two meter wide rolls. What they're actually able to get out of the paper will vary which can have a big thing to do with their, their overall costing. They do need to, as you say, print the pages then cut them out of whatever sort of paper that they're using and if you want to have a triangular book that's got you know a 10 inch side, a 10 inch side and a 5 inch side you might find that there's a whole lot of waste involved in that and it's hugely expensive to do. So yeah, definitely get your specs early, you know, really nailed down before you go out and get into the hard work. I've got a question here from Anil that I actually don't really understand, so if you wouldn't mind posting that one again, something about focus system. Oh, the lens calibration. Um, let's assume that's what you were talking about. Um, man, that's so easy. As long as you have a camera that supports it, um, you go in, you take a test shot at the center of the target, and then I recommend you pop the image onto your computer so you can see it on a nice big screen. And then you're looking at which of the numbers on the right-hand side. Let me just bring up that chart, so that image, so everyone watching at home can actually see it. Oh and I went in the wrong direction. There we go. So, and then if you're, you, so you focus on the center of the, the target on the, the main square there, then you're looking over to the right and if everything's perfectly calibrated, the zero and the line through the zero is going to be the sharpest part of the shot because that's on the same axis as the actual flat target. And that target you can just mount on a light stand or whatever or stick it on a pile of books, whatever. But if you go in and check it and you see that actually one in front of that is in sharper focus than the zero is, then you know that for whatever reason when you tell your camera to focus at zero, it's actually focusing a little bit in front of that. And that can be a big problem when you're using a small depth of field. Then you just adjust that in your camera, take another test shot until it's getting the zero sharpest and you're sweet. And that you know, for some lenses and camera combos that I own, it was 
almost right straight off and it just needed the minorest, the m minorest terrible language, the, the most minor adjustment. But others I found, wow, it was right down at three and I actually needed to adjust it as far as my camera would let me to get it to the zero. And it's not that your camera or lens manufacturer is dodgy or putting out uh, poor quality equipment. It can be just that that particular combination of lens and body together was focusing a little bit too far forward or back. So, you know, if you're going to buy great gear, spend the time, get the gear to make sure you're using it to its full potential. Will the Spider 4 calibrate an LCD TV 37 inch in the same way it will calibrate an LCD computer monitor? I think it depends on which model of the Spider. If it, okay, let me just get, uh, you want me to put you on audio or you want to give me the answer? One sec guys, yep. Okay. Good one. Easy answer. Sorry for the pause, everyone. If you're running it from your laptop uh, through to a big TV, it'll calibrate in its, it, it basically it is a monitor, so yes, it'll work no problem. If you're, however, running, say, your TV through the DVD player or whatever and there's no computer involved, then you need to get the Spider TV model, which, will, which is set up for that. And that's the same thing, you know, I personally don't have one at home, but if you're going to go and drop serious money on a big screen TV and speakers and all of that sort of stuff, you might want to make sure that your blacks are nice and rich and your colors are nice and accurate so you get the best image quality. Um, thank you to Bernard. He's just saying he enjoyed this one. Um, Okay, even after using the full suite of data color technology, how accurately is the printing of photos in a photo book if you are working off of a laptop? I always have issues with the brightness given that it looks different depending on the angle the screen is tilted at. Any tips? Yeah, you. the brightness is the biggest one and to be honest, I think for people who aren't calibrating their screens, 99% of people have their screen up way too bright, which washes out the colors and it just throws everything off. So when you use the higher end spider products, it will actually help you pick a, a white point, which will, so if your monitor has uh, a backlight or a brightness adjustment, you can actually adjust that. So it will tell you that this is the right point to be using when you want color accuracy. So for me, I know that that's nearly always just, a, and don't take this as being accurate for yourself, it's totally going to depend on your viewing conditions and your computer, but in my office with the normal lights on, it's just above 50% of brightness on my monitor, but when I'm web browsing, I like to turn it up because I just like the, the brighter background of the browser, but I know when it comes time to edit images that I drop the brightness down. And in terms of color accuracy, that's not uh, an issue specific to laptop. There are laptops out there with brilliant monitors. And as I say, you're better to use, I don't want to put down any particular brand, but a, a really cheap laptop with a nothing special monitor and have it calibrated than you are to have a thousand dollar monitor and not have it calibrated. So yeah, that, that's the response on that one. And then of course, there's great printers out there and there's less great printers out there. So, But if they're a commercial press and if they are aiming for professional market or serious photographers, they should be well calibrated in the kind of gear that they're using. Um, okay, here's one from Sand here. Sorry if I've mispronounced that. I just purchased a Spider Elite 4. I've been using it to calibrate my iMac. Is there a guide online that will step-by-step -step teach me to calibrate using any advanced mode. There is. Um, check out the data color forward slash support link. Um, I have to be honest, I don't know what you mean by using any advanced mode, but the, um, the support page is pretty, pretty handy and you can actually, on the data color page, they have some video tutorials. You can also find some on my uh, YouTube channel that I did before I was had a relationship with data color where I showed the process I went through to calibrate my screens as well. Um, good question here from Jim. Using lens cal, do you need to recalibrate after changing lenses? I.e., does one calibration only apply to a particular lens camera combo? Yes, it absolutely does. So, if you know your hello, 
up if uh, if you're using and you're lucky like me to have three or four different cameras, um, say if I'm going out with my D800 and my DF from Nikon and I'm sharing lenses between them, you absolutely do need to have each lens calibrated to each camera. And if say you're using a 5D Mark III from Canon and they're 24 to 70 and God forbid you smash your lens and you get a replacement, you need to recalibrate that one. But the cameras are really clever. Even if you, for some reason, own two of the same lens, the camera will recognize by the serial number which version it is. So if, you've, you, know, if you only occasionally use your friend's lens, so you calibrate that one, next time you put it on, your camera will remember the settings it needs to use and do it. I realize if you have a big arsenal of lenses, it may seem like a really big task, but it really is a couple of minutes to calibrate each camera and lens combo. Um, okay, I might get a bit of feedback from Luke on this one, a question from Doug Spowart. Um, I might have missed something, logged on 15 minutes late. When calibrating monitors for print output, what settings would you use to emulate paper? I think that's a, that's a big can of worms type of question. Is there a generic almost one sits, fits all answer? Okay, so Luke's saying go for 6500 Kelvin as a, a blanket answer, but it, it's definitely uh, more nuanced than that because there's a million different types of paper out there and a million different printers out there and different profiles and whatnot. Um, and also, it will use your, your printer uh, and get advice from them. So if, say, you were printing with Momento, they, uh, you know, the guys who work at those kind of companies are absolute experts. So if you call up with the world's most technical question, they're going to know the answer. They'll know for their machine and you know, all the different variables what are likely to be the, the best settings for you to get the, the optimal results in. You got to keep in mind they want you to have the best looking photo book you can too because it reflects well on them. Um, let's see. Okay, so Wes was just saying my early question, the LCD TV is connected to the computer and used as a monitor, then yep, as far as your computer is concerned, it is just a monitor. It's going through your video card or whatever you're using and outputting, so that is being, the color is being controlled by your computer, so yep, your, your spider will calibrate that for you. Um, just one thing to keep in mind, the reason that a huge TV can often be cheaper than a, a smaller monitor resolution, man. My 27-inch um, monitor has like over 2K resolution and it's, it's nothing special, it's nothing over the top, but if you want a 2K TV, you're talking big money. Um, so something to keep in mind. And often the color gamut, how many colors they can show, is a lot better on a computer monitor and there's refresh rates and stuff to think about as well. Okay, good question here from Chris. I'll just read it out to you all. It's a little bit longer. What are your thoughts on trying to get your photography more known in regards to putting a book together? Would you think it would be worth doing a small print run or would ebook be a better option given everything is online these days? I've been thinking about this for a little while now to get my photography out there more and more but somewhat on the fence. Okay, this is, um, you know, it's really difficult to give specific how should I grow my business advice to someone because even though photography is, there's a lot of things that we share, um, everyone in the room is a photographer of some type, what market you're in and how you're trying to present yourself and who your potential clients are will really change. So if you're aiming for a blue chip company to be your client or elderly wealthy families to be your clients or younger people, the kind of product that's going to appeal to them and in your city, in your country is going to vary. So I definitely, I know, let me think of two or three examples of guys I know in Sydney who are just kicking butt in that sort of area. One has a custom designed iPad that he's got this special hardcover case and he'll make a portfolio of images, load it up in this iPad, put it into like a protective case that you know will go underwater if it gets dropped in there and he'll send that off to them with a customized presentation that plays for them. And I know another guy who hand makes a printed portfolio of images that he thinks is appropriate for that client and will hand stitch the seams together and stuff and post that off. So you know 
there's a whole day's worth of work, that's going to be a big client that you're trying to impress that is going to appreciate the personal touch. If you want to just get your name out there to a lot of people, then certainly doing it in an electronic format is going to be the most cost effective and easiest to reach a lot of different people. Um, okay, this is a, a tricky one. I'm, I'm not a lawyer, Michael, but Michael's got a question. What happens with various brand names and trademarks in the back of images, i.e. Nike, Globe, blah, 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 that may be at an event? Um, do you need permission or is it reasonable expectation of use when they put it out there at events? It's going to vary depending on your country, definitely. But there's a thing, you know, same as even in countries where there's an expectation of privacy, if someone's a public figure and they're in public, then that's kind of the overruling factor there. I would say it depends on the event. If you go to some stadiums, they'll say you're not allowed to shoot here because of the sponsors, this, that, and the other. I would say if you're going to sell a picture of X sports star with a Nike logo in the background and you're going to use it to advertise another product, that's a big no-no. But if, it, if it's all out in the public domain in Sydney, as far as I know at least, You'd be fine to sell it as long as you're doing it to sell as a standalone product, not as a, you know, to advertise something else. So you couldn't take a photo of me wearing Levi's jeans and then use it to advertise Levi's. But you could take a photo of me wearing a branded piece of clothing to sell just as a fine art and very fine piece of art it would be, photograph of your own work. But check with your country, check with the lawyer. There are little nuances there, but uh, you know, again, I'm not a lawyer. Don't take this as a bulletproof answer. But I can't imagine that um, Nike is going to come after a photographer for having a Nike logo in the background of one of their books. Um, you never know; crazy things happen. But that seems really unlikely to me. Um, do, 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 do. Okay, one here from Guy. Um, Matt, my wife and I have done a couple of books and have had some large prints done. Having prepared the images and pages, I've been disappointed with the dullness of the final product. Is it merely an emissive and reflective problem or is that they're all to it? Do you have any tips? Um, Luke's nodding away as yes. I think it, it would. It's it's all a process, right? So having your equipment all calibrated and then having it go to the, the printer, the files right. Um, it, uh, it's hard to know without knowing was your printer calibrated and was all of your equipment calibrated. If you're using a monitor and uh, I feel like I can, this is an industry true thing that it's not going to shock anyone, Apple products often come heavily saturated out of the box. Um, so if, you're, if it's too bright or too dull or that kind of thing, you'll find that the, the color saturation and the vibrance is going to be different. So if your, for example, if your screen is up too bright and then you try and correct that, then when it goes to print, it's going to affect the final print quality. So it, is, it really is a, a chain and everything's interrelated. We're capturing the color right, seeing the color right to edit it, having it thereby correct in the file so when it goes to the printer, and then using a decent printer that has accurate profiles, um, it, it takes all of that to, to get it correct to how you want it. Um, interesting one here from Lisa. What's the best file size for a quality photograph? It's a, pretty much a linear relationship on how big you want to print the file. Um, I'm happy to be overruled by a more technical expert, but my understanding, the old rule of thumb of around 300 dpi came from the days of magazines where you might have it a couple of feet away from you. I'm getting a shaking head, that's not the case. Well, it's certainly what uh, resolution you need is going to depend on how far away you are from it. So a billboard doesn't need as high print quality as a magazine. Uh, a gallery print, people may walk up really close to it, but a billboard, they're probably going to look at it from 100 feet away. As a general rule of thumb, if, you're, if you want it to be optimal uh, print quality, then a bigger file size is more information for it to be able to, to print off. Um, when you're sending off your images and you, if you're going to go for, say, a 300 
uh, dot per inch resolution, then sizing your final image to match the or match or exceed the final print size that you're going to do is probably a good idea. There's no point sending a 1200 by 800 uh, resolution image and then to try and print it to a large size. I hope that adequately answered that one. Um, okay, Aaron saying, I highly recommend adding a section to your talk for future uh, use regarding profiles for print. The guys at KL will be able to help you there. So there you go, thank you. Um, okay, someone, Kent, saying it's pronounced the Adobe with lots of E's at the end. Thanks for that. Um, do publishers usually charge for sample prints? Um, there's two different ways that that can go, so, and I can only share with you my own experiences. When I went out to uh, potential printers for my book, I said to them, can you send me samples of stuff that you've printed in the past? This is the kind of thing that I want to print. It's going to be, I want it to be a higher end paper stock, print quality, all of that kind of thing. Um, and every single one of the printers was willing to send me either selected pages or a full book. There was only one who asked me to cover the, the, the postage costs for that. Um, but then at the other end, when we're talking about getting a printed proof of what you're printing with them, Absolutely. Either there's going to be an additional charge or it's going to be factored into what you are, are paying. So I mentioned this earlier, you might have come in a little bit later. If you want a full print production copy of your book, if you're doing it on a press, that could literally cost you thousands of dollars. If you're doing it on a, you know, on a digital press or a service like Memento, well, it's going to cost you a full, a single book cost. Um, but if you're going to print 20 copies, it may be worth doing it. If you're going to print 20,000 on a press, it may be worth doing it. But yes, um, there's not many industries now where people are just making super normal profits where they can uh, afford to just keep including and including more. For people, if you want more in the way of samples, then it's going to affect the price somehow. Um, Denise is asking, how does one find a broker? Now, that's one where I'm going to be a little bit elusive because the guy that I ended up using, I wasn't 100% happy with, so I don't actually want to recommend them. But if you go to Google, who's your friend, of course, and search uh, print brokers or uh, someone in your area, so, uh, you know, Southwest America, print brokers, something like that, you'll find a whole bunch of them, or fine art photography print brokers you'll find lots of them and they should be willing to send you uh, samples as well. They, they, if they're worth their salt, they should be really open and upfront about where they're based, what their commission structure is, all of those kind of different things so you know, you know, my, my guy was really honest. He, he didn't say that it was in South Korea to be honest. He said, we're dealing with printers who are in Asia but it's not China. <laughs> That's what he said that they used to but it wasn't worth the hassle in terms of um, you know, the mixed quality that they were getting um, and then they did all of the back and forward with them getting the technical thing side of things done. So you definitely are paying a premium for it. Of course, no one's going to do that work and not be paid for it, but they may also be getting uh, job lot rates from the printers which may end up balancing it out to the point that you would have gotten if you'd gone to the printer directly. Um, Okay, Jose is leaving and had a great time. Thanks, thanks for the feedback. Um, no need to send thanks for when we answer your questions because we're going through a list and um, the more thanks we get, <laughs> the, um, the longer the list gets. Um, okay, the Dijan is asking about how do you adjust your lens focus um, using this, the lens cal. I have done a video on this one and it varies by your camera manufacturer but you're basically going into the autofocus or the focus fine tune menu, find where that is and then it will just give you a little plus or minus, it might say it let you go plus or minus 10 or 20 or 30 points and you adjust it however much you need to get the focus point to be in the right spot. Keep in mind the most basic, uh, not basic, but the entry level models from Canon and Nikon don't offer that feature but the mid-range and up do offer that feature, so it'll just depend on checking your actual camera. 
and there's a list of those listed on the, the LensCal page, I believe. Okay, uh, Stephen asking, the conversion of files from PC to Mac can cause issue with fonts and colour. Embedding fonts is imperative even with PDFs and confirm requirements with printers. So not a question, but just a bit of feedback. Yep, you definitely want to, um, that's something for a designer, maybe Stephen has a bit of a design background, but that's something any designer worth their salt is going to embed the fonts because if I don't have them, it's not going to look right to me. Um, Let's see, okay, it looks like these next ones are going to be um, answered already. Another one here from Denise. I was shocked at how different and beautiful the colors were after I calibrated my monitor with the Spider Pro 4. I just couldn't believe it. Well, I think we might have to run that as a billboard ad. Thanks for that feedback, Denise. That's lovely to hear. It's, um, you know, and I'm really glad that that is your experience, but for some people who've gotten used to everything being super saturated and super contrasty, they may find that it doesn't blow their mind, but it will suddenly be accurate, which when you're doing printing, accuracy is paramount. You don't want it to look beautiful and punchy on screen, but then when it actually gets printed, it looks flat. You want it to match, so accuracy is the key. Um, one here from Paul. Have you ever tried printing HDR images and experienced color bleed in your photo book? Uh, fortunately, no and no. Um, so I can't offer a lot of insight on either of those issues. I'm not a big fan of HDR um, and the, yeah, I, I don't think I've ever printed a HDR image full stop. Uh, let's see. Um, when you were creating a book, you recalibrated your monitor every day. How often would you recalibrate your monitor for photo viewing use? So I normally do it at least every two weeks. Um, that I'm actually not even sure what the official recommendation is if it's two weeks or a month, but it gives you a bunch of different options. So, um, and it, I should point out with the recalibration, that's not a laborious or even an interactive process really. You turn the program on, put the device on the screen, and it goes through the processes, makes the changes it needs, you just hit save and that's it. You, in the time it takes you to go get a glass of water, it's probably finished the process. So that's not one where you need to be really engaging or to be any kind of a technical expert about it. Uh, okay, there's a couple of questions here I'm not really following, but let's see. Um, and Neil is asking, I think this is still about the lens, Cal, so is there a number input for each lens? The cameras will generally recall which lens is being calibrated, otherwise it will give you uh, like a custom lens one or two, but generally it will recognize if it's one of the modern lenses that has a computer chip in it, it will recognize what the lens is and which particular lens it is based on the serial number. If you're using an old manual lens, you might need to tell it uh, which you would anyway, like if when I use my old Nikon 50mm 1.2, I tell it that this is custom lens 2, so it knows what its maximum aperture is, what its focal length is, and then its autofocus adjustment as well, which is pretty cool. You can adjust the autofocus of a manual focus lens. <laughs> um, how often do you need to recalibrate the camera lens combo using the lens cal, if at all? I I don't think it's likely, you know, if you bump the lens or whatever and over time things can wear and adjust, but it definitely not a two weekly kind of thing. You'd be talking months and months or if you don't find that it goes out, maybe just recheck it every six months or a year or something, but uh, it would be if it takes a good bump or a tumble or something, then I think it would be worth taking another check. Um, so I've got one here from Dijan about calibrating lenses. Can I do it? Uh, you've probably heard the answer to that one already. Yes, you can. It's not too difficult. Uh, the lens cal, I'm not sure where you're based, Larry. Um, it's actually, let's see. Okay, so in Australia they're just under 100 at KL, they're 95, but it's 20% off at the moment. Um, Nicholas, what color temperature should you use when you're calibrating your monitor? That's a, another funny one. It depends exactly what you're going to be doing with the file types. Is there a general answer you'd give for that one as well? 56 or 65? 6500. Um, 
Peter Cunningham, is there a typical price ratio between hard copy and ebook? Look, that's actually a funny one, and if you that opens a bit of a can of worms for publishers everywhere. Uh, with people like Amazon and iTunes totally dominating the world market for ebooks, they pretty much have a, a stranglehold on the pricing of them as well. So when I was looking at it, the their pricing models and this could have changed, but when I looked at it, it was just ridiculous. They're basically saying every ebook needs to stay under ten bucks because if you don't, we're going to charge you about a seventy percent commission to sell it for you. So if I sell it for nine ninety five or I sell it for nineteen ninety five, I'll actually earn more selling it for nine ninety five because I'm just giving all of that money to Apple or whoever in higher fees. So if you're going to go through one of those companies, you have to take that into account. If you're going to do it yourself, like I have, um, then pricing pricing's a, a whole that's a whole nother talk. Maybe that's worth looking at for another one. But you have to look at what other people are selling things for, what you think it's worth, the work that went into it, your reputation, all of those kind of things. In terms of ratio, I don't know that there is a set ratio. As I said, mine is 80 plus postage, which in Australia postage is free, but to other countries that's up to 35 or 40 dollars. So that's up to 115, 120, and the ebook is 35. Well, that's all 20% uh, off at the moment. Um, question here from Bob: What color gamut do you use? sRGB, Adobe, or something else? It depends what you're using it for. Um, they're, they're just they're different gamuts. Um, Adobe RGB or Adobe RGB uh, is a, a bigger gamut overall, and for printing, that's the one that I personally am using. Um, Norm asking, I'm an artist, As are there any special issues using scanned images and photos together? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean exactly, probably not, just um, try and make sure the quality matches so they don't uh, stand out and of course make sure that you have the right to use the images. Um, one from Peter Cunningham, does the lens cal set the camera for one aperture only and or distance from the subject? Look, they have a guide on what they recommend to, to shoot it on. Uh, you want to calibrate it wide open, that's going to be the most accurate. If it's a zoom lens, generally you shoot, you'll calibrate it using the long end or if you always tend to use, say you're using a 24 to 70, if you use it at all lengths, you would uh, set it up at 70 mil at f2.8 but if you know that you always shoot that lens at 50 mil, then calibrate it at 50 mil. But that's going to be the most accurate thing. And it, it's worth, I mean, like I said, I calibrate all my lens with it, but you're going to find the most profound difference with your primes because they're faster. You might have a 1.8 or a 1.4 where you've got three millimeters depth of field on your shot. So there having it correctly calibrated is going, you're going to see the quickest you know, feedback that things are working for you. Let's see how we're going. We're getting more and more questions. We'll probably keep going through for another 15 or 20 minutes or so. Um, got a few people just saying that they've just um, logged on. Um, someone saying that the internet had a problem. Will they be able to find the recording of this webinar after the fact? Uh, yeah, you will. And I think if you've registered, then an email will come out to you and you'll be able to get back to it via that. So make sure you've used the correct email, guys. And that's where the, the deals will be sent and if you happen to win one of the, the prizes. Um, Kent, I was a Kickstarter backer and really like your book. Thank you very much, Kent. Uh, it is well done, exhibits great use of light, whether natural or artificial. I've also watched many of your videos. Thank you for sharing your expertise. Well, that wasn't meant as a Dorothy Dix. I actually thought there was going to be a question in amongst that, but thanks, Kent. I'll definitely take that. Um, yeah, of course, um, light, whether it is artificial or natural, is the key to all photography. So getting to make light your best friend and your photography is really going to take off. And somebody's going to win, the, or a few of you are going to win a copy of the Intimate Portraiture video series, and we look exactly at that, at the different types of light sources and how you can work with them to get the results you want. Um, Paul asking, can dual monitors detrimentally affect photo book production consistency of images? Certainly if you're using different screens that aren't matched, that could be an issue. If you're uh, 
if one always shows colors differently to the other and you're editing off both, then the photos aren't going to match. Um, the higher level spiders do have an option where you can get different monitors to match each other. Um, of course, if you're using an Apple monitor and a Dell monitor and a Wacom monitor, they all function differently. So the technology that can make them all show the right thing um, is a, a great thing. Um, an X-Rite i1 uh, display calibrator came standard with my Samsung LED monitor and has always failed to calibrate. If I buy the Spider, would I be better calibrating and working on my cheaper monitor if it does not work on either my Samsung? I, ha I usually have the editor run a quick digital proof for me before it goes to print and tweak any issues currently. Um, I don't know that particular model of Samsung, but I can't see why the spider wouldn't work on it. Because the spider talks to your 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 video card, right? And the the color profiles that your computer is actually displaying. So I would say it's going to work. But as a general response to that, not knowing the specific uh, hardware you're talking about, you're better to use a cheap monitor and have it calibrated than an expensive monitor and not have it calibrated. And I've got some other feedback coming. Uh-huh. Okay. For that particular one or all Samsungs? Okay. Um, so Luke, the technical whiz in the background here, Michael said that he's heard that um, some Samsung monitors, and it could be the one you're talking about, when they don't hold their profile. So when you turn it off, they actually lose them. So that could be what's going on. You want to uh, make sure that you're not turning it off too often. Um, Let's see, let's see, let's see. A few people saying bye and telling us just little bits of feedback. Thank you for that, everyone. Um, can you tell us what impact ambient light has on calibrating with the Spider 4? You, you definitely do want to take that into account, but the, the Spider 4 actually will do a, a reading of the ambient light and take that into account for you. So it does make a difference if you were shooting at home and it's near a bright uh, window with the screen in direct sunlight and then at the office you're under fluorescence and then at somewhere else you're in a dark room, you would calibrate at each of the three different locations and choose the one you're in because that is going to affect it. Of course, just like your camera, your eye doesn't actually see what it's looking at. It sees whatever light is reflected off that into your eye. So the light that's bouncing off your screen has to be taken into account as well. Um, another question about the lens cal that we've already answered. Would you recommend a monitor hood? If you're shooting in a, sorry, if you're editing in a room where you have a lot of uh, light from different directions, then yeah, definitely. Um, I haven't, I don't use one on a daily basis, but I do use a, and I'm getting a smack on the hand for that, but I am using, I use hoods all the time and loops when I'm outdoors. Um, my studio, fortunately, is kind of dark and dingy, so I don't have a lot of ambient that I need to contend with. But yes, for optimal uh, results, yes, uh, any full-time editor will be using a hood. Uh, I've got this, let's see, let's see. Matt, do you think it's necessary to have a non-glossy monitor? I'm specifically thinking iMac, which I have at the moment. I personally find it difficult. That's going to be again to do with the ambient light, and it can make it tricky. Uh, back in the day when I had a, a MacBook Pro and they had the glossy or the matte screen, I did get the matte one, uh, matte for matte. But now the Retina display one that I have doesn't give you that option. There's only the one, and they're all glossy. So uh, that's where using a hood or being careful with the ambient light you're editing in will make a difference. But I tend to, if it's for something for editing, I would it, choose matte if I have the choice. Uh, is the cube used in lieu of the checker or is there no redundancy there? Look, the checker is much more comprehensive. It gives you all of the color stuff, whereas, sorry, the, yeah, the checker, whereas the cube is just giving you your tonal range. Um, there is some redundancy they do do some things as well you know you can get your black and white point off the color checker as well 
but for a pitch black reading and for the highlights, the I think it's only the cube is going to give you that, and for all of that rich color information, only the checker is going to give you that. Um, I had a blurb print a book that had two HDR two page images, and there were halos around the images. That's HDR, dude. I was surprised because I used the high quality paper, took them out, and it was all good. Not a big fan of HDR either. Okay, so it could be something to do with uh, the paper, but halos are the most common thing with HDR. That's just something you're dealing with. Um, if you found that changing the paper made a difference, then uh, yeah, there you go. The, there are so many different variables in paper. KL actually printed an exhibition for me once and they printed out similar images on different stocks of paper and the images looked so different and it, it is an aesthetic thing that you want to take in mind. It's not just how does the page or the print feel in your hand but also how does it look and does it have a texture, does it have a sheen, all of those kind of things. One here from Dijan again. Adobe Lightroom changes my overall color profile when an image is open. Oh, I think it's does. Does Adobe Lightroom change my overall color profile when an image is open for preview? Even though my monitor is calibrated with a Spider product, how can I avoid or fix this? Okay, the answer is if it's Windows, you can't fix it. And if it's Mac, is there an easy fix? If it's Mac, then it should be fine. It should be uh, staying within your calibration. Um, Okay, we're getting to the skinny end. Lots more thanks, lots more thanks. Um, one here from Michael White. Did you pay up front for your graphic design and then use Kickstarter to fund the printing once the project was definitely ready to go to print? I don't remember the exact timeline. I actually got a designer online who had really good references, got an idea for them, exactly all the specs as I said. Um, I think from memory I had confirmed the graphic designer but I hadn't paid them when I did the Kickstarter. But all of these kind of projects when it becomes commercial, that's one of the trickiest things is working out timing. So I need this to happen before that and then that and then that, but this one needs to be paid now and you know you want to keep everyone on side. As a small business person I always try to do my best to pay an invoice when I get it on the day I get it pretty much because you know, cash flow is such a difficult thing for people. So I don't remember where I paid the graphic designer in relation to Kickstarter, but I always try to pay as early as I can um, or to have some kind of arrangement where, you know, you pay a percentage up front and then a percentage once the product's delivered. For, if it's the first time you're working with someone, for example, my new website, I the first time I used that designer, I paid them at the end of the job and then for the second job I happily paid them at the start because I know they're great and they delivered and they got a family to feed just like we all do. Um, another question here from Ernest Chu, thanks Ernest. The spider has a stand to sit the sensor on to read the ambient light but it doesn't say how I should position it. E.g. do I point out the screen turned off or towards me or towards the wall etc. I'd say you want to have it facing towards the light source, wouldn't you? Oh, still towards the screen, but away from the screen. Okay, yeah, so you would have it on the stand towards the screen, but not right touching the screen. So it's basically it's seeing what kind of light is falling on your screen. That's, that's the job of it. Um, it doesn't care how bright is the kitchen, just how bright is the area right around the monitor. That makes sense, that's right. Um, Rob, thanks mate, uh, Matt, appreciate uh, another thank you for your support in the community, my pleasure. And then a couple more thank you, thank you. So thank you all for this, it's been really fun. Um, thanks, big thanks to Data Color for organizing this. This is their platform and every second month I'm going to be presenting a topic and Australian legend of photography, uh, Peter Eastway is doing the odd uh, months, sorry I lost my words there for a second, so make sure you look out on the KL website, on the Data Color Facebook page and all of those places, they'll be promoting the upcoming ones and of course I'll be sharing them as well, um, going through all different topics related to photography and specific images, uh, that were, you know, so this is the one on photo books and in two months I'll be back with something altogether new. Thanks again to Momento for jumping on and uh, giving away that prize. 
uh, check your email in the next couple of days. The email will come out with details of who's won prizes and details for the discount codes so you can grab any of that data color gear or a copy of my Intimate Portraiture or Private Bodies ebook. And I think we're good. Thanks again to KL for all the logistics and making this happen. I would have been totally lost without it. Um, and thank you all for your questions. This would have been a fairly boring PowerPoint presentation if it hadn't been for all your questions and for sticking around and looking at the attendees. It seems pretty much everyone's still here, so that's really nice. It's the Q&A section that these really come alive. So thanks everyone, and we will see you again soon. Bye. The organizer has ended the session and this call will be disconnected.